COVID-19 has changed all aspects of life, work, and careers, especially for athletes who haven't been able to travel, train, and perform at their peak. The impact of the crisis will be acutely felt at the Tokyo Summer Olympics this week, rescheduled from last summer because of COVID, as these athletes learn what their can-do attitudes and flexible, often improvised training over the past year due to the pandemic will affect their performance as they take their places among their peers to compete for those hard-fought medals. Hello, everyone. I'm Chitra Raghavan, and this is Techtopia. The pandemic also has forced sports startups to adapt along with these athletes to become nimble in challenging times as the pandemic shut down sporting events around the globe. I'm joined now by Chris Williams, founder and CEO of the Seattle-based sports data analytics startup, Zelos, which is taking track and field analytics to a whole new level for athletes, coaches, and fans. Williams is a former pole vaulter and hurdler at the University of Washington and he frequently writes and speaks about his experience as a former NCAA athlete and a data engineer. And I should add by way of disclosure that I'm on Zelos' advisory board. Chris, welcome to Techtopia. Thank you, Jethra. Uh, It's great to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a pole vaulter and hurdler and what drew you to the sport? Yeah, uh, so uh, to know me is, you know, you really have to know my family. uh, And I come from a track and field family. So my sister ran track and field. Uh, my father was a hurdler as well. Uh, both of my cousins, uh, plenty of aunts and uncles competed in the sport. Um, you know, I would go to their meets, uh, you know, they, they would come to my own. And growing up, my biggest sports idol was my sister. And so I would, you know, go to all of her track meets and not, I'd follow not just her, but, you know, all of her competitors too. And uh, you know, from, you know, the hours I spent, you know, at, at these track meets, you know, I, I just, I, I really, you know, grew an affinity to it. And one day my, my dad said, okay, son, you know, you played a few sports, um, but, uh, you know, now's the time to really think of something to stick with and, and that you want to do throughout your high school career. So for me, it, that was a pole vault. Uh, something about the pole vault just captured my imagination and, my dad, you know, a little surprised to hear that that, that was the, the sport I chose, was, was all aboard. And we clearly remember driving to Home Depot to, <laughs> to get my first pole vaulting poles. And my first pole vaulting pole was actually a wooden dowel. We wrapped it with uh, red tape. And uh, I, I used that for a couple of years while you know, learning the sport. And since then, uh, it, the, the sports afforded me a, a scholarship at the University of Washington. I've been able to you know, travel and compete around the world. Uh, and, you know, looking back at my career, I just, you know, sport in general, uh, the opportunities it provides and the skills you learn within it really every day is what, you know, keeps me going. Um, and excited to, you know, build applications for the track community and then other athletes. So, and, and I have to add, just hearing some of your stories that your entire family is still crazy competitive, even today with the exercise and fitness. And, and it's pretty, pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So I uh, come from an incredibly competitive family. My sister, she just gave birth um, a few weeks ago, actually, just, just over two weeks ago. And, but, you know, several months ago, she was seven, eight months pregnant every day looking at her apple watch trying to compete with my with me my, my dad uh on, on the peloton bike two or three times a day uh, my, my dad as well as you know extremely competitive loves to hike you know track his performance you know in, in his apple watch and that you know undoubtedly has rubbed off on me and is, a, is also a huge driver of you know uh, the value i see in creating transparency and and accessible ways to find competitors and open up avenues to for your own goal setting. So how did you pivot from athletics to data analytics? What happened? You know, there's few moments in, uh, in one's life where they can look back and future um, is totally dependent on that, that one moment. And, and for me, one of those moments was when I visited, uh, you know, it's just sat in on a lecture uh, my freshman year in college. Um, I, I was recruited by the University of Washington to compete as a pole vaulter. And it was just to kind of walk around campus, you know, exploring some of the buildings and, and knew that there was this uh, uh, lecture coming up. And uh, to my surprise, the, the lecture was about collective intelligence. Uh, I had no clue what that really meant. And, you know, no, <laughs> not really an idea of 
the lecture that, you know, the professor Batya Friedman totally, uh, you know, in, in an hour and a half captured my imagination and described something so profound that, you know, I, st I still look back in all of, of um, her own research and where the field could go. But collective intelligence is essentially uh, how humans or, you know, any sort of organism can make decisions better together than alone. And that, uh, you know, as someone that was passionate about, you know, teamwork and progress, that was really exciting for me. And, and, I, and I thought that that, uh, you know, information itself, she described it in a way there was a physicality to it. Uh, she, you know, you think about our, our genome, uh, you know, something that's been around for millennia. It all comes, you know, it's a, it's a program. It, it's, it's all information. And, uh, you know, those same traits and, uh, and characteristics of information still apply to us as a, as a organism, as a, as a unit in sociobiology. And, uh, you know, so the way that she described it, you know, at that time had me thinking extremely large uh, and uh, maybe want to pursue a career somewhere, you know, in, in the field of information science. And then what happened next? Yeah, you know, started to take classes um, uh, in you know computer science and uh, informatics, uh, and was uh, took also a few, you know a few business courses and was lucky enough to get an internship at a venture capital firm that really focused on early stage startups and enterprise software, and so uh, you know that was a, a incredibly new experience for me as well, and uh, you know tasked to scan through thousands and thousands of companies on the bleeding edge, you know, who are thinking 10, 15 years down the road and I really kind of got my feet wet in entrepreneurship and startups from the, you know, the investing side of the table um, and learning about, you know, all of these companies, I started to see these, you know, higher level patterns that really came down to breaking down data silos and leveraging your data uh, to make better decisions, to be more compliant, to be more connected with your team. And I thought, wow, you know, what if track and field, how much stronger of a sport would track and field be if we had a single source of truth for, um, for our competitions or um, a, a way for athletes to you know, accurately track their training and, and how that correlates with game day or, or meet day. And that was, was, a, was a kind of another defining moment, which was the kind of genesis of, of Zelos. That's amazing. So before we kind of dive into the power of Zelos and platforms like that, and how it's transforming the world of sports. Give our listeners a sense. This is something that blew me away when we first started talking. The size and scale and passion around track and field around the world, it's pretty extraordinary. The numbers of runners, both casual runners and uh, really amazing, uh, incredibly accomplished athletes. Definitely. I, you know, and you know, as, as all, or as, as many successful business opportunities start, it's, uh, it's an overlooked or, or an undervalued market that you know, the product or the service serves. And track and field you know, is very, very, uh, in, in my opinion, a very overlooked uh, sport. It's the largest sport, participatory sport in American high schools. You know, there's over a million athletes running. Uh, that's more than football, basketball, um, you know, baseball, soccer. And it's also the fastest growing sport out of those. So uh, that was actually something that, you know, years ago when, when I learned that and it, it's still uh, the largest and, and fastest growing. Uh, you know, I, I just, I thought that was totally, uh, was contrary to, to what people believe uh, in, in you know, what people think of the sport in, in terms of the numbers. Uh, it's also not, not just in the States, uh, it's the marathon itself is the largest sport in China. You know, there's millions of athletes uh, running, 30 million athletes around the world will cross the finish line in a road race every year. And it's extremely big. And, and you see companies like Strava and other you know, very runner endurance focused applications or, or sports that, that have really exploded over the past uh, five years and at post COVID are you know, growing even faster. And what do you think are the reasons that drive this global passion for running? Yeah, and so with track and field in particular, I mean, there's great gender parity. Uh, and so you, you have just as many women uh, participating as, as men. And so compared to other sports, there where there's, you know, a difference in participation rates. Uh, that's, that's a huge reason why it's a larger market. Also, it has such low barriers to entry. 
uh, you think, you know, barefoot running, uh, it was a really successful, you know, and, uh, you know, popular theory for years where, you know, you didn't, ha you didn't need shoes where, where, you know, it's running is so ingrained in us as humans it, and it, it doesn't take any, you know, additional courts. So it's, it's extremely inclusive. It's extremely diverse. And I think those are the two key reasons why it's larger and has more potential uh, than other, you know, team sports or big air quotes, revenue generating sports that, that you typically see on, on ESPN. And globally, what are the numbers like? In China, there's it's the largest sport. So millions of, you know, tens of millions of athletes that are competing um, in China uh, in, in track and field. Uh, Japan also, you know, has a huge um, affinity for, for marathon racing and in the States, there's uh, 20 million athletes that, that, that will compete. And that, that deals with, you know, from the, you know, the 100 meter dash to the marathon and you know, different, different field events in between, whether that's the steeplechase or, or the race walk or, um, or the shot put. Track and field athletes, I mean, all athletes, of course, are consumed by data, right? That they're performance data. But I, I, I was fascinated by uh, the stories you were telling me about track and field athletes when ever since, you know, from the time you're little and you're getting more and more advanced uh, in the sport, how the data actually drives you, the kind of note-taking athletes do. Uh, talk a little bit about that. As those, you know, we talk to professional athletes every day, you know, learning more about their stories, what drives them, their, you know, their habits. Uh, as an athlete myself, I know that, you know, I, I relied on, um, you know, note-taking. This was, you know, before Apple Watch and Fitbit, uh, and you know, I had a, I had a notebook and, and a pen, and uh, every day I would track how many push-ups I did, how many sit-ups I did, what bungee I cleared, how many miles I might have ran, and uh, and then, you know, tried to see. You know, it was it was rough, but you know, I looked back on the journal and, and tried to figure out, you know, how that aligns and and, and how to set myself up for success in a race. Um, today, you know, there's, there's no excuse why an athlete shouldn't be tracking themselves for, for their own health, uh, and, and to just improve their performance. And that, that's, uh, something that's been consistent across a lot of the athletes we talk to, whether it's, uh, taking notes themselves or, you know, wearing a Garmin or all, all sorts of, you know, different devices, you know, personal tracking is, is, is critical and for success these days, uh, and with in a data rich sport like track and field where in the hundred meter dash uh, a hundredth of a second it's not that small i mean it's close but you know races are determined by hundredths of a second weekly it's common and yet the until recently technology hasn't really kept up with it and even coaches and athletes and of course fans are have been very very paper driven right i mean there's large volumes of paper and it's just very hard to collate across the board and be able to find patterns of performance and patterns that they can use to get better. It's just extraordinary how paper-driven the sport is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, agreed. And you mentioned that in, uh, you know, I think back of a conversation that I had a few months ago with, with a coach of mine, uh, where, or you know, a coach that Zillow works with. And I asked him if, if he could send us anything that, any materials that, you know, would help us as, as a software company understand the decisions that he, you know, he needs to make, and and how we can leverage, you know, software and, and our data uh, to empower their team. And uh, so, the coach, Coach Ed, told me, "Oh man, you know, you should have asked us uh, a few weeks ago. I just threw away a hundred pounds of paper results, and that just blew my mind. Yeah, I, I, I just think about all, you know, the time." Um, so, so when an, when an athlete says, Hey coach, you know, do you remember what I ran three weeks ago? Um, at, you know, at, at this meet, he will point them to that stack in his office and they'll have to go through that. <laughs> how do you even figure it out? Yeah. How do you, how do you figure it out? I mean, there, you know, every meet there's thousands of athletes and it's, it's data rich, but you know, with that, the sport is, you know, very antiquated and there's a huge opportunity cost to, you know, to not being able to generate insights quickly uh, and you have to sifting through papers, whether it's meat results or training plans, uh, nutrition plans. So tell us a little bit then about Zillow. So we've kind of talked about how this paper-driven 
a culture, because we didn't have technology like we do today, has forced athletes to you know rely on scraps of paper to try to figure out what their patterns of performance are. So, so you created Zelos. Tell us how Zelos works and what the difference is in terms of the analytic and predictive power of platforms like yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we're, what we're doing really is uh, we're building the first consumer analytics platform for the sport of track and field. You know, data on performance results have never really been centralized on a global basis, which makes it, as we, you know, as we discussed, really tough to track progress, evaluate potential, you know, identify competitive advantages. And so, so what we do is, you know, we build out, we have a, a, a dashboard in which uh, it gives you powerful search analytics and data visualizations to see career histories um, and, and, and to compare and, uh, your performance in different environments. So, so far we, we've integrated about 20 million performances. And from that, we've generated about 300 environmental factors and descriptive statistics. Um, and this all goes back 50 years. So it's a very old sport uh, and, and there, there's a lot of data. And uh, that's really uh, what we've focused on. More and more, we see the opportunity for creative media, you know, opportunities to create data-driven media um, that gives more insights to users, you know, wherever they're at, whatever they consume, whether it's a you know, blog or social media. And you know, that, that's another way to create more in interest, engagement, um, and insight in the community. So you've been able to integrate 50 years of, of track and field data into the platform? Yes, and a lot of that was, is, it was paper. That's crazy. So in terms of the volume of data, how much is in the Zelos platform? Yep, so uh, we have about 20 million performances um, uh, for over 4 million athletes. Uh, and that ranges from different skill levels and ability levels. So, so you were going to launch Zelos last summer uh, when, uh, during the Summer Olympics, right? There was a campaign planned and then COVID hit and everything shut down. So what was that like to, you know, I'm sure other sports startups felt the same sense of, you know, gloom and doom and panic almost because the world of sports was shutting down and people weren't really performing and the Olympics were shutting down. What was that like to have a sports startup and have the world of sports shut down? Yeah, man. Wow. Yeah. The, you know, what a year 2020 was and um, still 2021. And, you know, looking back, uh, totally, you know, you know, at that time, no, you know, getting a sense that sports might be canceled and then you know, learning that the, the Olympics were going to be postponed after spending a, in a lot of time and effort planning for, you know, what that would look like, as well as building tools that were to help coaches plan their seasons uh, and, you know, get the most out of their resources and, and you know, help their athletes live up to their potential. And so that, uh, you know, at the time, devastating, I have to say. There was a lot of uncertainty, but, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, I, when I look back on it, you know, I, I feel incredibly fortunate for, for the team we have on board and, you know, in the resilience uh, of, of the sport track and field and, uh, and you know, people still being interested in, in following, uh, whether that was, you know, historical results, when meets weren't happening, uh, or whether it was speculative about what's going to happen in the next seasons. So COVID really became a forcing function for us uh, to build, to leverage our data, it, you know, in new creative ways and, and to learn, you know, how to get by with less. And today, you know, I'm almost thankful <laughs> for that experience. You know, it's, it's pushed our product forward. Now we have, we have a, a tool more relevant and a platform uh, that's more usable uh, by many different types of, of more types of individuals. Um, and we're much stronger as a company. You know, what, what else, uh, what, what else could you throw at us? We're also in a, in a totally new world and uh, with change, there's opportunity. Uh, so today, you know, I, I, I feel fortunate that, that we've survived, that we had, that we have teammates that, you know, believed in what we were doing, you know, that, that we had some luck and we had, we had a couple good ideas that, that, uh, you know, really, really kept us top, top of mind for some people. So um, you had been planning to do a whole bunch of analytics around the Olympics last year, and you decided to go ahead anyway and to do more of a, a simulation, pretending as if the Olympics were going to happen. And then you also attached a uh, fundraising campaign to help track and field athletes who traditionally, I, I didn't know this until we started talking that 
track and field athletes don't have the kind of sponsorship and fancy, you know, shoe companies and uh, garment companies and all these things, you know, like a lot of other sports uh, do. And tell me how you pivoted uh, to deal with it and the kinds of analytics you did during the simulation and, and what were the results of that uh, for uh, in terms of the your predictive abilities and how true they were. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yep, for a little bit of background, you know, our, our, our tool now, I would call it a platform. It's, uh, it's so much more uh, rich and, um, and features and, and functionality, but, uh, we started as, as a, a way for coaches to streamline, you know, their processes and, uh, make better decisions faster, you know, rather than spending 20 hours planning a schedule, uh, for a lineup essentially for, for your team, you know, we, we could help them do that in, uh, in less than an hour. And so. That that is what we had been building, and, and but we we did have data, and that we we, we felt you know maybe it could be relevant to, to some other people, and so we we set, we sat down kind of with that in mind, saying how else can we leverage what what we built, and you know with COVID primarily we felt for the athletes, as many of us were former athletes, people training a decade to get to where they are, and you know, you know many were totally capable of making making the Olympics and. That's just something that's off the table for, for another year. That was really tough. And on top of that, knowing that athletes, many track and field, professional track and field athletes are barely getting by. Uh, the average track and field athlete makes $20,000 a year. Uh, to actually go to the games, it takes 40,000. Um, travel and training and um, you know coaching and uh, healthcare. And so we kind of started with how can we help? How can we help the sport? In this tough time, because uh, because you know without track and field, it was, yeah, it was our bread and butter. How we started, and so, so we thought, you know, how can we help? And and then while we were brainstorming, we, you know, another another idea came up that was, well, what if the Olympics did happen? So from there, you know, we we ended up actually building out a simulation using historical performances from uh, the 1,700 athletes that were most likely to qualify. Um, and in that simulation, we generated the res results down to every place for every race, prelims, semifinals, finals, um, and published according to the 10 day schedule. Uh, so, you know, through that, uh, through that programming or, you know, our, our hypothetical results, uh, we ended up being able to partner with USATF that really helped us get um, you know, build more funds and, and, you know, grow our reach so that we could get more money to athletes. And USATF is for people who don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's USA track and field. So that's the, you know, the governing body, the FIFA essentially of, or I, sh I should say the, the, the U S soccer of, of track and field. And so, you know, that, that was, especially as American athletes, uh, unfortunately are often, you know, ones who struggle the most, you know, having them on board, bring attention to the issue was really valuable. And, um, and then when it comes to the data, there was a lot of interesting results as well. You know, one, as a pole vaulter myself that, that I just, I, uh, I love and uh, is excited that we were able to, you know, have this level of specificity uh, is that we predicted Mondo Duplantis winning the Olympics with a jump of six meters and seven centimeters. Uh, so we, we use the performance histories uh, like of, of these athletes and, and other contextual information uh, up to that moment. And 10 days later, Mondo jumped 607, so down to the centimeter um, in Switzerland to break the Diamond League world record. Uh, so that, that was a, a, just kind of a, a cherry on top, of, you know, of, of uh, being able to provide for, for more athletes is generating some some fun and inaccurate insights for the sport. And so some of the scholarships you handed out uh, to athletes uh, resulted in some really good news, right? So last year's Summer Olympics actually are this year's Summer Olympics that we're in the middle of. And what was the good news you found out recently? Yes, uh, man, I uh, so excited. We chose six athletes that were Olympic hopefuls, but unsponsored and validated by the community that uh, were deserving of, um, you know, of, of a, a grant that, that we fundraised for the games. and. That was to help them, you know, make it to the next Olympics and you know, follow their goals and or you know, follow their dreams. And out of those six athletes, all of them were able to have a healthy season, uh, an outdoor season this past year. All of them have made it to uh, an Olympic trials final, uh, which is incredible. Many were not actually 
pr projected to, to make it that far. Uh, and uh, we just found out that uh, another, so this is our third, uh, but uh, Curtis Thompson, a javelin thrower for Team USA, uh, actually won the trials, won the US trials, unsponsored, unattached. And he's going, you know, he's going to the Olympics. He has, he has a shot at doing really well on the world stage. And so, you know, being a part of his story and his journey uh, is so exciting and gets us excited for other athletes we can identify and with potential as well as support. Given the popularity of the sport, right? We've talked about that. Why is it that these athletes are, aren't as appreciated in sense of sponsorships and scholarships? And what is the cause of that given that these millions and millions of athletes that are winning these incredible medals and breaking unbelievable records? Yeah, so, so that, there's, a, there's a, quite a bit behind that. Um, and and I, I have my own theories. Uh, but but I you know I feel a lot of the, the difference of you know you have baseball players NBA players making millions um, who are at, at, at the top of their their sport uh, but you know the best athlete in the world um, you know might not be making even a million um, might barely be making a hundred thousand you know that that would be really great uh, and in in my in my opinion it's it's a it's a lag. You know, I think we're trailing behind a lot of other sports and we're held back by uh, this idea, which, which I, in, in theory, it's, uh, I, I think it's uh, productive and constructive, but uh, in practice, it's devastating. And that's amateurism. And so, you know, the, the Olympic spirit and, and you know, in, um, as many people that are familiar with Olympics and you know the philosophy, uh, the Corinthian spirit, uh, is the passion of doing something not for money but just for uh, the love of it, and uh, the, you know the love of the, the action or the exercise, you know, and which which I, th I think does it, it sends a great message and and, it, and definitely applies to to so many athletes who are not in it for the money but uh, they just love what they do and they love improving themselves and but the the one thing that's kind of lost in that is that. Track and field is actually a very, very lucrative sport. It's incredibly lucrative. And the money is just not going to the athletes. And that's because athletes don't have any ownership of the franchise that is, you know, USA Track and Field or uh, World Athletics. And companies, or sorry, uh, well, yeah, companies, but also leagues and, and franchises uh, uh, like the NBA, very early on, or earlier on, you know, decades ago, and franchise the athletes to be a part of the system, uh, and that, well, well, you know, that in itself blew up the sport, uh, blew up these sports, you know, such as basketball, uh, and also the, you know, the the, the amount uh, of money that the athletes can make. And so, track and field just recently, or, you know, our our national governing body, or sorry, international governing body, just changed its. A name from the International uh, Amateur Athletics Federation to just World Athletics. Uh, and so I, there, there is a shift in the professionalism of track and field, but for so long, uh, I think it's been held back by this idea that, um, that athletes shouldn't be paid because it detracts from the sport and that money should just be going to the organizers. You know, I, I definitely think that's changing and, and especially as people are looking at uh, you know, the, the sheer numbers of participants in the, in the sport and with social media and, uh, and, you know, streaming platforms, that opportunity, you know, content in, in the sport becomes a lot more valuable. Uh, and uh, whereas for a long time, people have thought of sports in terms of TV time, hours, uh, you know, getting a spot on, uh, you know, Monday Night Football. But it must be so aggravating and confounding, you know, to see athletes in every other walk of life walk away with these lucrative scholarships and, you know, sponsorships and all kinds of things. I mean, athletes are incredibly rich, but to not have a similar uh, level of uh, wealth associated with track and field, uh, I'm sure that you experienced that as an athlete yourself, and, and then you see it for all these other athletes who are working so hard and training so hard, but they just don't get that kind of compensation that other athletes do. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. And, and so, you know, part of it's amateurism, and then 
Another part is just, you know, politics in, in, in the sport. So looking back at this year and a half and the incredible impact of COVID uh, on sports around the world, what do you think the long-term effects of the pandemic will be on track and field and sports in general? What are the trends that you see emerging or you believe will emerge? Yeah, so I, the trends that are, are emerging, you know, we, we've seen that people don't actually need to be in a stadium for, you know, for an exciting game to happen. And um, I, I think viewership, you know, in, in, in different events will be more, def, certainly more digital uh, and people will be more, I think eventually stadiums will be, you know, packed once again, and that would take some time. Um, and and in, in the meantime, uh, streaming is, is a huge platform and an opportunity uh, to distribute media and, you know, games, results, sports shows. So, you know, that, that's, that's an emerging trend in terms of, you know, personal health and fitness. That's, we, we've seen that explode in, in COVID, you know, people uh, have found running to, to be a, you know, a great way to be outside. It's safe. You're, you're, you're not in a gym where there's a lot of equipment that's being used by who knows who and, uh, and I think the, the that passion and in, in the growth of distance running and uh, you know personal fitness is going to continue. Uh, people are going to continue to value that. Peloton, you see, you know, that they've had massive some, some acquisitions and you know and massive growth. Uh, Apple Watch, Fitbit, things like that. Definitely. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today on Techtopia and for the insightful conversation. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for, the, for, for having me on. It was so much fun talking with you. Uh, appreciate the questions. Chris Williams is the founder and CEO of the Seattle-based sports data analytics startup, Zelos, which is taking track and field data analytics to a whole new level for athletes, coaches, and fans. Williams is a former pole vaulter and hurdler at the University of Washington, and he frequently writes and speaks about his experience as a former NCAA athlete and a data engineer. This is Techtopia. I'm Chitra Raghavan. Techtopia is a podcast from Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups with brand strategy, positioning, and narrative. Our producer is Jeremy Kaur, founder and CEO of Executive Podcasting Solutions, with production assistance from Kate Cruz. Our creative advisor is Adi Weinland, and our research and logistics lead is Sarah Muller. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. And if you like the show, please rate it five stars, leave a review, and do recommend it to your friends, family, and colleagues. For questions, comments, and transcripts, please visit our website at goodstory.io or send us an email at podcast at goodstory.io. Join us next week for another episode of Techtopia. I'll see you then.